generally as otolaryngologists right as from with the data that we have in front of us we believe that taking out your tonsils probably does not have any long-term implications on your overall immune health Hey guys, Dr. Ndave here with NJENT. I'm joined by these handsome gents, Dr. Reddy, Dr. Smith is less handsome, but he's here. Um, anyway, today we're going to be talking about tonsils, uh, and we had the title as Soup to Nuts, which both of them did not like our title, but it's about going from the beginning of tonsils to the end of tonsils, what they're about and what we do about them. Um, so our format's going to be a little bit different today. This is going to be more of me asking them questions, and I'll chime in from time to time. Um, it's going to be like pop pop quiz, hot shot, Dr. Smith. What movie is that from? Come on. We, we don't Keanu watch Reeves. Movies. Yeah, we don't have time. He's the movie buff. Speed, <laughs> pop quiz, hot shot. All right. Anyways, so I'm going to be asking some questions. And they hopefully will provide you with some good information. Uh, so first, I'm going to ask Dr. Reddy, um, what are tonsils? So tonsils are um, these tissue in, in the back of your throat. Um, there's different types of tonsils. There's tonsils actually in the back of your nose called nasopharyngeal tonsils or adenoids. And then there's tonsils in the back of your throat called palatine tonsils. That's the tonsils that most people think of. And then you have the tonsils by the base of your tongue, um, which are called lingual tonsils. Uh, the tonsils we're going to focus on for today, I think, is just the palatine tonsils. And essentially, it's this type of tissue called lymphoid tissue, which um, is part of your immune system. And the, the theory is for your palatine tonsils that they may have played a critical role in your immune system, probably when you're uh, at birth to maybe like a few years old. But after a couple years old, it's thought that your palatine tonsils don't really play a significant role for your immune system. Um, that was perfect. I actually answered all three questions. But the uh, so. I wanted to ask Dr. Smith more about what Dr. Reddy talked about with lymph nodes. What 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 do lymph nodes do? Um, where are the lymph nodes, not just in the tonsils, but everywhere in your neck and elsewhere? What, what do they generally do? So lymph tissue essentially is the filter for the body. It traps kind of viruses, bacteria, and uh, other foreign materials and presents them to the body for a, an allergic or an immunologic reaction which is your body's way of seeing something, recognizing it, and making a response. And so your tonsils are lymphoid tissue. It's an aggregate of lymph uh, tissues responsible for presenting some of these viruses, bacteria, and foreign particles. And the lymph nodes themselves, again, are kind of these aggregates of lymph tissue uh, that help drain and filter out for our immune system so that we can make either a memory response or a faster response the next time we see something. Um, it's also responsible for not making a response, which is equally an important thing, uh, making sure that we're not making a response to things that shouldn't be foreign. And sometimes when things go wrong, that's when um, you can start making a response to your own tissues or making an overactive response to things that otherwise should be relatively inert. Yeah, I was just going to bring bring up the point that, you know, we've we all have patients and or friends or family that will have like an outbreak of strep tonsillitis in the house, but not everybody gets it despite being exposed to it. So all of our tonsils behave differently. Some tonsils will behave more strongly. Some will not have any response at all. And it really is patient specific about when you get sick. It's not just being exposed uh, to the pathogen uh, that automatically gets you sick. So uh, there are some patients who will recurrently get tonsillitis or will recurrently um, have big tonsils, but will have the same exposure as another person who has zero of those symptoms. Um, so we, we see tonsil patients a lot. It's probably one of our most common 
common uh, things we see in the office. But Dr. Reddy, can you just tell me a little bit about what what most patients complain of when they come to the office? So that kind of brings you to the tonsil issue. Yeah, most people, the, the primary complaint that you see is sore throats. So just trouble with pain around your back of your throat, um, trouble with swallowing, pain with swallowing. Sometimes um, patients will complain of ear pain and you get this referred ear pain going from your throat into your ears. Um, and uh, these infections can, you know, these, these sore throats can be frequent. You can have these recurrent episodes, multiple episodes in a year, or they could be chronic where patients just can complain of just this chronic low grade kind of sore throat that's bothering them. And Dr. Smith, if somebody doesn't have a sore throat, but you think they still have a tonsil issue, maybe some other symptoms that they might complain of? Yeah, a lot of people think? complain of like foul breath or like a, a foul odor within their mouth or halitosis would be the medical term for that. Um, and they can, may complain of um, tonsil or stones, which are these little chalk-like debris that kind of uh, exude from the tonsils from time to time. And within the tonsils, there's these cryptic kind of caves uh, that these little food particles and, and debris can get in, in the bacteria that lie within these crypts and kind of make these little um, kind of debris stones that, that come out from time to time. Um, I'm not sure if that's exactly what you're alluding to, but, you know, yeah, a lot of patients yeah. complain not just of infections, but these uh, tonsil stones as well. And they can be pretty pesky. They can be pretty uh, painful when they start to come out of the tonsils as well. And so people try to do all sorts of things like um, use long cotton uh, tips or Q-tips, uh, use a water pick to try to flush them out. You know, a lot of times we recommend gargling with just something kind of water or salt water after anything, any meal or anything sugary to try to wash out all of that sugar debris that might cause these tonsil stones. Um, but truly, there's not a whole lot that you can do to prevent tonsil stones. Um, it, it, chronic infections and recurrent infections often triggers these because of these crypts and caves that form within the tonsils. Yeah. Um, the, the last symptom that I, we're, I wanted to allude to uh, was sleeping issues. Um, so, Dr. Reddy, can, tell me about what somebody might complain about with regards to that and what might bring you to the tonsil issue. Yeah. So, you know, if you have larger tonsils and the tonsils have kind of overgrown, then you can have issues with snoring, uh, mouth breathing, and sometimes even sleep apnea where your snoring is so severe and the resistance in your, the back of your throat is so severe that you're actually having pauses, pauses or cessations of, in your breathing while you're sleeping, really, uh, which results in, you know, decreasing oxygenation levels. So, you know, if you, if you have snoring, sleep apnea issues, and you have large tonsils as the primary cause, removing the tonsils or reducing the size of the tonsils can significantly improve your sleep quality. And this is especially true in children when, you know, the caliber of their airway and the size of their, the back of their mouth, uh, what's called their oropharynx, um, where the mouth meets the throat, that area is really fine and constricted already. And if they have, you know, these big nuggets back there causing obstruction of their airway, um, you know, removing those tonsils significantly improves that airflow and that air that decreases that resistance, that upper airway resistance. Adults can also have that problem, but because their airways are so much larger, you know, sleep apnea is often more multifactorial when it comes to adults. It's more rare for an adult to have tonsils so large that it causes major obstruction, but it does happen. So uh, let's let's talk about that between the kids and the adults. So the adults, it's pretty easy to have somebody tell you that either they snore a lot or their spouse or partner says that they're snoring a lot. Uh, snoring by itself doesn't necessarily mean that you have sleep apnea. It just means that there's a vibration inside the back of the throat and the back of the, the nose possibly. But if like you, if Dr. Reddy alluded to, if that happens where you have pauses in breathing, that can truly cause a stress on your heart and lungs, uh, increases your risk for certain uh, heart disease, stroke. Um, and that, that is a significant risk factor for heart and stroke uh, in patients that don't have any other risk factors for those two diseases. 
But Dr. Smith, if a child, if the parents say that they have snoring, but they aren't really sure if they're having pauses or gaps, maybe what are some other symptoms that the parents might notice during the day or other symptoms that they could complain about that would allude you to this sleeping issue? Sure. So, I mean, often in adults, they complain of daytime sleepiness or needing to take naps. And that can often happen in children, too. Uh, children can have, a, you know, issues staying awake. So if you have, you know, a three or four year old who's typically starting to outgrow naps, you know, they may need still frequent naps. And so, you know, often I'll ask parents, all right, if you're not sure, you know, the first thing we can do is maybe start recording the child for a little bit, go in there, you know, take a look at them while they're sleeping record their breathing for a little bit, see if they're having gasping, choking, pauses, but other behaviors that you can look for, if you can't kind of get that out. You know, bedwetting is one thing that can that can happen with chronic sleep apnea, um, even uh, mood kind of instability. So kids that are having um, uh, hyperactivity, sometimes that can be linked to sleep apnea as well. So we think about like um, mood changes, uh, bedwetting, and so those behavioral changes, anything that really changes with the child's behavior can be a sign of sleep apnea. But certainly, you know, I've had uh, parents who have brought kids in who even during my exam in the office chair, which is typically a stressful thing for kids, you know, they're so tired, they've, they've been asleep almost the entire time and aren't really arousable. And that's, that's typically a sign of some pretty significant sleep apnea. Correct, correct. All right, so then we figured out that the tonsils are a part of their problem, whether it's for infections or for sleeping issues. Is there any other less common reason that a tonsil might be a problem, Dr. Reddy? Like, um, there are rare um, reasons for why a tonsil might be a problem, especially if you, the, the thing that comes to mind is if there's a growth within the tonsil. So, um, and there's many different kinds of growths that can occur within the tonsil. Uh, the most common growth in a child would be um, a type of cancer called lymphoma, where you can actually have, um, you know, a, a cancer growing within the tonsil. And um, so if you ever, you know, if we ever see a child with one tonsil that's significantly larger than the other, that's one of the first things that, you know, we worry about. And in adults, um, a thing that we really worry about with asymmetric tonsils or one tonsil that looks different, completely different than another tonsil is a tonsil cancer. And the most common tonsil cancer in adults is squamous cell carcinoma. And now the leading, the leading type of the leading cause for this type of cancer is HPV. Dr. Reddy, what does HPV stand for? So HPV is a uh, human papilloma virus. In the past, actually just very recent past, the most common cause of tonsil cancer was uh, excessive smoking and drinking. But now the most common cause is actually just exposure to this virus called HPV, which almost the, the majority of the population has actually been exposed to at some point in their lives. But you're more likely to have had exposure to this particular virus via um, sexually transmitted diseases. Dr. Reddy, do you remember the different types, subtypes, and the numbers associated with the benign growths and the malignant growths? Yeah, so um, HPV 6 and 11 are usually associated with the, with the low-risk um, types of, H of uh, papillomas okay. and other uh, growths like that, which aren't usually typically cancers. But the, the tonsil cancers, the squamous cell carcinomas that we worry about are usually associated with HPV subtypes 16 and 18. Bonus. Also, for all of, these, all of you guys watching, me and Dr. Reddy have the same shirt on for all of our podcasts, but Dr. Smith has changed one of his shirts. He was worried that all of you were going to judge him. Um, <laughs> Make sure you judge Dr. <laughs> so, <laughs> Dr. One, Smith. One one thing to, to to mention a little bit of a soapbox thing is that you know hpv cancers are very preventable it's one of the only cancers that we do have a vaccine for so it's something that i would say absolutely talk to your your primary care your pediatrician your you know your medical providers about uh vaccination with the hpv vaccine and whether it's the right choice for you because that is one thing that 
you know, hopefully as we all continue to practice, we will see less and less and less of as the vaccine becomes more and more prevalent and uh, active in society. I don't know how young you can be and still get the vaccine. Do you know? I, th- I believe it's around age 12. Um, the, the Gardasil vaccine, you know, is widely, um, widely used and given to females, but okay. now has been FDA approved for males as well. So not only it, it's, it's important for all males to be vaccinated for this as well. Okay. Yeah. So now we've figured out the tonsil of the problem. We got to do something about it. Um, Dr. Reddy, you want to talk about the metal thing, medical things that we can do about them? And then, Dr. Smith, you talk about the surgical things you can do about them. Sure. So, you know, if you have a tonsil infection, you typically treat it with antibiotics. And um, sometimes we also add some steroids if you're having a lot of swelling or a lot of pain and discomfort. If, you're, if we're talking about tonsil stones, the medical management is... Uh, things like a water pick, which Dr. Smith alluded to before, um, to try to clean out your tonsil or crypts. You can also do frequent saltwater gargles, um, especially after eating sugary foods. And then um, after that, if not, if all of that fails, then usually surgery is warranted. Um, do you have a rule for how often you will give antibiotics before you jump to something surgical? Yeah, you know, there's um, there's different criteria that people use. Uh, one of the most widely used criteria, if you have um, seven or more s- sore throats or tonsil infections in a year, in one given year, or if you have five or more in two consecutive years, or three or more in three consecutive years. But th- that also has a lot of play because there might be somebody who just keeps missing school, but they haven't had all seven infections in one year, and you just need to yeah. pull the trigger. Um, or if they have other complications like a peritonsal abscess, which we'll have another podcast about. But Dr. Smith, you want to talk about the surgical stuff? Sure. So surgery, uh, tonsillectomy uh, is certainly not one of the most fun things to undergo, but it's often very necessary to help reduce the amount of infections that can occur or for sleep apnea, as we mentioned before, you know, more and more now we're probably doing more tonsillectomies in children for sleep apnea, sleep disorder, breathing, then chronic tonsillitis. Uh, you know, and the, we've gotten much better at treating strep infections. And so strep is becoming less and less of a, of a chronic issue, but certainly that still does exist that kids are getting seven strep infections in a year and five for two and three for three. Um, but certainly surgery is, is the mainstay of treatment for tonsillectomy. Historically, that tonsils were removed with um, uh, curettes or um, a wire dissector or a guillotine. There's a million different ways to take tonsils out. However, the most common way of taking them out is a traditional tonsillectomy using electrocautery dissection to go around the tonsil between the muscle and the back of the tonsil pillar and removing the tonsil tissue from within that little muscle pouch uh, on both sides, basically from the top of the palate down to the to the um, the top of the tongue base or the bottom of the back of the tongue. There, um, the tonsils can be removed in a in a kind of a newer matter in which we do what's called an intracapsular tonsillectomy. That often is done in children to try to decrease bleeding and uh, the pain as well after tonsillectomy. And so the difference with this is that instead of going all the way around the tonsil capsule and taking all the tonsil out along the muscle bed, you're leaving a little fine rind of tonsil tissue uh, in that pouch and then kind of heat sealing or cauterizing all that residual tonsil tissue that's left there, uh, which decreases the bleeding rate and and also the the pain. The the big uh, concern is tonsil regrowth, you know, depending on how much tonsil you leave behind there is a, a rate of regrowth that can occur if you do like an intracapsular or partial tonsillectomy uh, versus if you do a traditional tonsillectomy where you're removing all the tonsil tissue, it's pretty rare to get regrowth in a traditional tonsillectomy. And certainly over the years, all sorts of devices have been gen- generated and developed to try to reduce 
pain, which is always our biggest concern after tonsillectomy and bleeding rate, which, um, you know, probably should be our biggest concern after tonsillectomy. But um, these, these devices, whether they use um, radio frequency um, or um, electric cautery or laser, all of them kind of have very similar outcomes as far as pain, discomfort, and bleeding rates afterwards. And so really it's making sure that you, you know, your physician is comfortable using whatever device they're most comfortable using and taking these out. That's right. We all have different ways of doing things, but the yep, outcome absolutely. ought to be the same. And each individual surgeon will have their, in their hands, the better way of doing things. Uh, Dr. Dr. Reddy, can you talk to me? Dr. Smith already alluded to a little bit, but about complications of tonsil, tonsillectomy. Yeah, the biggest worry we have with um, tonsil surgery is bleeding. Uh, and the reason for that is that the tonsils are situated very close to branches of the external carotid artery. And it's a very vascular area, especially if your tonsils, you know, if the tonsils have been through a lot of chronic inflammation and recurrent infections, you're much more likely to have an extensive blood supply there. So the bleeding rate is probably, you know, around two to 3% nationally. Um, and the, and, and a post-operative bleed can typically happen anywhere between day zero and day 14, most likely to occur days one through three, um, right after the surgery, but sometimes can also occur most commonly in, you know, about day seven through 10 when whatever scab may fall off and cause another bleed. Now, most bleeds can actually just be treated probably just conservatively with just, um, soft diet and um, maybe even an in-office cauterization. But sometimes, you know, the thing that we dread the most is having to have to go back to the operating room and cauterize the surgical bed. That's really the biggest risk. There's other, there's other more, you know, rare risks that we worry about. Um, sometimes you can get small scrapes or injuries to your lips, teeth, or gums. There's a, the small amount of the anesthesia risk with tonsil surgery. Um, in some patients, um, this can happen a little bit more in children, and it's usually a temporary phenomenon. There's this entity called VPI or velopharyngeal insufficiency, where you can potentially have temporarily usually where you're swallowing liquids, it can kind of come out of the mouth. Um, and that's just usually a temporary problem. Um, and then it, it, the, the other thing you worry about in kids, especially especially young kids that have severe sleep apnea and very large tonsils is um, the potential for post-operative pulmonary edema or fluid buildup in the lungs. And for these kids that we worry about that possible complication, we typically watch them overnight in the hospital on the pediatric service to make sure that we aren't dealing with that rare issue. Um, the other thing I wanted to bring up um, and that is also a real risk. Uh, and it kind of has to do with one of the things about a tonsillectomy that both Dr. Reddy and Smith alluded to, which is that it is an incredibly painful surgery. And yeah. it just, it is what it is. Um, it's much more painful the older you get. Kids, obviously it's painful, but but not as bad. And so you, what you don't realize is that you probably swallow a thousand times a day, but after you get your tonsils out for that first 10 days, You'll notice every time you swallow, it hurts every time you swallow. And because of that, you have the risk of getting dehydrated because you don't want to drink anything. So rarely, not very commonly, but rarely we can have, especially kids, pop back into the hospital just for some IV fluids just to get rehydrated. Um, and that might be one of the risks too, is just needing IV fluids. Um, I think we both, we all three alluded to the worst part about tonsillectomy is either the bleeding or the pain. Um, can you guys think of any long-term complications of having the tonsils out? There aren't many. Yeah, you know, we. I think there's been, there's been some people that looked at put the potential long-term immune um, issues that can happen after tonsillectomies, and it's pretty it's pretty controversial. But generally, as otolaryngologists, right as from with the data that we have in front of us, we believe that taking out your tonsils probably does not have any long-term implications on your overall immune health. Yeah. Um, and, and he's not talking about getting more infections. He's talking about 
other things that have to do with asthma and stuff. Uh, people get less infections after you take your tonsils out, um, which is that has been very definitively proven. Um, so that's all I have for the tonsils. Do you, do you guys have any? I think we went, we really did go from soup to nuts with these tonsils. Um, please like and follow us. Again, if you haven't checked out our website, it's njent.com. Um, make sure you rate us five stars. All three of us are relatively handsome. Care of the front. And check out our Instagram page, New Jersey ENT. And uh, we'll see you next time.